So good morning, everyone. Today is June 19th, Tuesday, uh, the celebration of Juneteenth. For those who aren't familiar, and I quite frankly was not too familiar with Juneteenth, but I looked it up, and this is the day on which the last of the slaveholding states uh, joined into the Emancipation Proclamation. Two years after, this was in, in 1865, two years after Abraham Lincoln issued it, the last state to free the slaves was Texas. So I won't make any commentaries on that, but Texas, uh, we're, we're, what we're celebrating today and many people in many parts of the country are, uh, are, are celebrating is the definitive end of slavery throughout the United States, uh, uh, and uh, I think something definitely to, to celebrate. This coming Sunday uh, will be the Nativity of St. John the Baptist, celebrating his birth. And so we have a picture, a Renaissance picture, I don't remember who painted these pictures actually, but of the uh, birth and circumcision, actually, of St. John the Baptist uh, with, you can see down in the lower right-hand corner of the uh, top picture, um, St. Uh, Zachary, Zachariah, with um, uh, the, the quill and the scroll where he is writing the name John, which we will see in the, uh, in, in, in the Gospel. And then the following Sunday is the 13th Sunday in Ordinary Time, and we have two events in that gospel depicted here. One is the woman who for 12 years um, had a constant issue of blood uh, touching the hem of Jesus' garment and being healed, and then uh, raising to life the daughter of Jairus uh, in the uh, second part of that, of that reading. So, as we usually do, let's begin with a prayer, and I've chosen the, uh, the Collect Prayer for the 13th Sunday, and uh, let's simply say that together. Let us pray. O God, who through the grace of adoption shows us to be children of light, grant, we pray, that we may not be wrapped in the darkness of error but always be seen to stand in the bright light of truth. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. One of the things that strikes me about this particular prayer is that um, uh, we pray that God, who has already made us children of light, that we may always be seen, be per perceived, to stand in the bright light of truth. Notice it does not talk about believing certain truths, but rather standing in the light of truth, recognizing that Jesus himself has said, I am the way the truth and the light. Uh, what for me is real food for thought and prayer is that there are no truths of our faith. There is only one truth and that one truth is Jesus Christ himself. And by his light we perceive all else that is true. So Jesus Christ himself is the standard by which teachings, doctrines, uh, events, all of the things of this world are measured. And so there is one truth and we strive in our, in our own often feeble way to approach that truth who is Jesus Christ. And so let's move on to how we celebrate that truth that is Jesus Christ in the Nativity of John the Baptist. 
uh, one of the things that I'd like to comment on is the church does not ordinarily celebrate the birthday of saints. The, like we celebrate somebody's birthday. I was born on September 6th. That's when we celebrate uh, my birthday. Each person in here has your own birthday. We celebrate that. The church doesn't celebrate those days for their saints. Um, they celebrate the birthday into eternal life. It's, uh, we, what we celebrate is usually, in almost all instances, the date of death. And that starts from the earliest days when all of the saints, the first three centuries, the only ones who were really recognized and venerated as saints after their earthly life were the martyrs. And so they celebrated the, the day of martyrdom as their day in, of entry into eternal glory. Now, there are a few exceptions to, to celebrating the, the death, uh, but, but in only three instances do we celebrate the earthly birthday, which you can see there and we'll speak a little bit more about it. Uh, but there are a few exceptions. There are some saints where we celebrate the day that their relics were transferred from one place to a place where they would be venerated more greatly. There are a few saints, I don't remember who they are, but there are a few saints where that is the, that is the day. And then, interestingly, two of our most recent papal saints, John the 23rd, he died on June 3rd, 1963. But his feast is on the anniversary of the opening of the Second Vatican Council, which was October 11. So to celebrate the, we celebrate the feast of Saint Pope John the Twenty Third on October 11. That is the day that the Second Vatican Council opened. It's interesting that John the Twenty Third is also celebrated as a saint by the Lutherans and the Anglicans. And they kept the traditional type of dating. And they celebrate, they observe his feast on either June 3rd or June 4th. I'm not sure why some do June 3rd and others June 4th. It may be that, that the uh, June 3rd was taken up by something else uh, and they just transferred it to the next day. But usually, uh, the, the Lutherans and Anglicans celebrate him on, uh, uh, celebrate basically the day of his death. Now, John Paul II, also Saint John Paul II, died on April 2nd, 2005. But his feast is on the anniversary of his papal inauguration. Uh, his papacy began actually with his election, which was on October 16th. But John Paul II's feast is October 22nd, which was the day of the big ceremony of his uh, inauguration and installation as Pope and as Bishop of Rome. So just a little bit of trivia. You can ask your children, your friends, your relatives and, you know, uh, uh, about how we determine saints' days, and you can give them that little bit of trivia about uh, John the Twenty-Third and um, uh, John Paul the Second, who really are modern exceptions to that tradition. And it's interesting also that the Protestants uh, observe uh, John the Twenty-Third actually on the day that Catholics would traditionally observe. So all kinds of strange and wonderful things going on. Now, Mary, we celebrate the day of her conception, December 8th, and we celebrate her birthday, uh, September 8th, nine months later, count them. And then her death day, the Assumption, on August 15th, and uh, the uh, Eastern Church celebrates 
on that day the Dormition of Mary. We in the West tend to look at the triumph of Mary being assumed into heaven. And in the East, they tend to look at Mary falling asleep, dying, and then being brought by Jesus himself into, into heaven. Uh, Jesus, of course, we celebrate his uh, Annunciation on March 25th. Count them. Nine months later is his birth, December 25th. And then we celebrate, of course, his death and resurrection at Easter, Good Friday and Easter. The only other one that we celebrate his earthly birthday is John the Baptist. Today, or this coming Sunday, June 24th, is when we celebrate his birthday. Um, that was my dad's feast day. His name was John. And he celebrated that day in a particular way. Uh, interestingly, he celebrates his birthday, but uh, my dad preferred, I guess, not to celebrate um, the beheading of John the Baptist <laughs> as his day, which was August 29th. So, what about John the Baptist's celebration of his birth? One more thing we need to note, and that is there are relatively few feasts any, any longer that are celebrated with a vigil. The birth of John the Baptist is one of them. So that the Saturday evening Mass, technically speaking at least, is different from the Sunday Mass. And so it's celebrated with a vigil Mass. And if we look at the readings, we're not going to look at the readings of the vigil, but if you look at them, you know, the Gospel uh, tells us of the um, of the Annunciation of John the Baptist. Remember the incident of uh, Zechariah in the temple? And uh, it's his turn to perform the incense ritual, and he stays a long time, and when he comes out, he cannot speak. And uh, he's seen a vision, and the vision is of the angel Gabriel uh, promising the birth of John the Baptist, promising that he will have a son. But because of his doubt, he was uh, rendered speechless. And uh, that the other readings on the vigil kind of look backward, look to the anticipation of the coming of this prophetic forerunner of Jesus. The Mass of the Day, which we will look at, looks forward. So it does speak of the event of his birth and his circumcision and his naming as we will see in a minute, and his significance as the forerunner, as the prophet who will prepare the way. So let's look at the, um, the gospel for the, uh, for the feast, the day of the Nativity of John the Baptist. And who was reading that? When the time arrived for Elizabeth to have her child, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown his great mercy towards her, and they rejoiced with her. When they came on the eighth day to circumcise the child, they were going to call him Zechariah after his father. But his mother said in reply, No, he will be called John. But they answered her, there is no one among your relatives who has this name. Okay, what, uh, one just interesting thing to point out. I always like to uh, uh, um, play with words and to discover the origins and meanings of words, and in particular, names. Um, Zechariah, or Zachary, which we often find in English, is Hebrew for God has remembered. The I-A-H refers to Yahweh. And then the prefix is uh, has to do with remembering. So God has remembered. Elizabeth is God is an oath. Or it can be rendered God is abundance. 
And her name uses a different form for speaking of God, the, the Hebrew word El. And uh, so El is a bet. Um, God is abundance. And John, Yohanan, goes back to the Yahweh as a prefix, and it means graced by God. By the way, do not confuse John with Jonathan, because Jonathan is a different Hebrew word, which means God has given. So, Yohanan, John, was named as graced by God. Now, there's another interesting thing going on here. Of all of the writers of the, of the New Testament, Luke seems to be the uh, most careful in depicting historical events and being accurate in his history and culture. But he made a big boo-boo here, Luke did, and that is um, they would never call a male child after his father. That was not a Hebrew tradition anywhere, and it's not recorded anywhere in, in, in the Old Testament. Uh, he would sometimes, a male child would often be named after a grandfather, but you would never uh, uh, name a male child after, after his father. So that was not something that the townspeople in the family would be saying, oh, let's name him uh, Zechariah after his father. No, um, that simply would not have been done. But it does help the story along here because it shows that, that uh, John was named by God, by the angel uh, speaking for God, and that it's pronouncing that name or writing that name that actually frees up the voice, makes Zechariah able to speak. So it does have a purpose here. Even if it might not be literally, factually correct, um, that little event does have a purpose here, and uh, wonderful. Now, moving right along, after this controversy about his name, so they asked his father, who could not yet speak, what he wished him to be called. So they made signs asking his father what he wished him to be called. He asked for a tablet and wrote, John is his name. And they were all amazed. Immediately his mouth was opened, his tongue freed, and he spoke, blessing God. Then fear came upon all their neighbors, and all these matters were discussed throughout the hill country of Judea. All who heard these things took them to heart, saying, What then will this child be? For surely the hand of the Lord was with him. The child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the desert until the day of his manifestation to Israel. We want to remember just a little bit of geography here, and that is... Uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth were in a hill town, traditionally I think it's called Ein Karim, uh, a few miles from Jerusalem, not too far, up in the hills towards the Dead Sea because there's mountainous territory between Jerusalem and the Dead Sea and then it, then it dips down very precipitously, uh, way below sea level to the Dead Sea. But so they were down in, you know, probably two days, at least two days' journey south of Nazareth, where uh, Mary and Joseph uh, uh, came from. So where uh, Mary was in Nazareth um, uh, when the Annunciation happened, and she traveled two days to go down to be with her cousin, her cousin Elizabeth. And so uh, John was already kind of the prophet announcing the uh, coming of Jesus in his birth because everybody who heard about it marveled that God has done something wonderful here. 
And uh, John's presence probably, as he was growing up, was sort of stay tuned. Um, so uh, this kind of is a conclusion of the narration of the birth of John the Baptist, and uh, it looks forward. So let's see what the first reading from Isaiah has to offer. Hear me, O coastlands, listen, O distant peoples. The Lord called me from birth. From my mother's womb he gave me my name. He made of me a sharp-edged sword and concealed me in the shadow of his arm. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver he hid me. You are my servant, he said to me, Israel, through whom I show my glory. Now, who is the me who is speaking? Um, it's probably not the prophet personally, but rather the prophet representing the entire people of Israel. The recognition that God has given birth to the people of Israel and given them a message that through them his glory would be revealed to all people. And uh, that also, of course, is what is summed up in the uh, birth and the mission of John the Baptist. So moving right along. Though I thought I had toiled in vain, and for nothing useless spent my strength, yet my reward is with the Lord, my recompense is with my God. For now the Lord has spoken, who formed me as a servant from the womb, that Jacob may be brought back to him, and Israel gathered to him. I am made glorious in the sight of the Lord, and my God is now my strength. Notice where this passage is from in Isaiah. It's from the second part of Isaiah, where the kingdom of Judah, or Judea, is still standing, but is threatened by the Babylonians. And this is a word of encouragement and comfort to them that not only will the Lord continue to be with them, but that Israel, the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom, which was also referred to as Jacob, would be brought back. They had been destroyed 200 years earlier, and they were scattered. And so there is a clear sense of restoration to come that God will use his people uh, to bring about a restoration of the way that God intends things to be. And so, moving right along. Is it too little, he says, for you to be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob, to restore the survivors of Israel? I will make of you a light to the nations, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. It was really, really painful to the Jewish people, the, the, the people of, of the kingdom of Judah, to have experienced that their, uh, uh, how would I say, sister kingdom of Israel had been destroyed and scattered. So they hoped for a restoration. And now God is saying through the prophet Isaiah, Everybody will be restored. My salvation may reach to the ends of the earth because you will be the light of nations. Now, that means uh, uh, John the Baptist is going to be pointing to Jesus who will be truly the light of nations. So we go now to the first reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Here is a sermon uh, of St. Paul that he delivered in a, in a synagogue. And uh, uh, so let's go ahead. Who has this one? Pat? Pat. Right. That's what this is. Okay. So the second reading, Acts 13, 22, 26, 
In those days, Paul said, God raised up David as king. Again, God testified, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will carry out my every word. From this man's descendants, God, according to his promise, has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus. John heralded his coming by proclaiming a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And as John was completing his course, he would say, What do you suppose that I am? I am not he. Behold, one is coming after me. I am not worthy to unfasten the sandals of his feet. My brothers, sons of the family of Abraham, and those others among you and who are God fearing, to us the word of salvation has been sent. Okay, just to notice here, uh, Paul is speaking to Jews in the diaspora. I don't remember which city he was speaking in. I should have looked that up. But uh, in a Jewish synagogue in a Greek town, probably somewhere in, uh, in Syria or in Turkey, uh, what we now call Turkey. And he always went to the synagogue first and spoke to the Jews assembled in the synagogue how uh, utilizing their scriptures, their identity as a people, how Jesus is the fulfillment of that. Now, John the Baptist was well known in the diaspora, even apart from Jesus. And there were a lot of people out there who knew about John, knew about his baptism, uh, thought it admirable, and so on and so forth, who were completely unaware that he was the forerunner of Jesus. So the ground is all right, groundwork has already been laid somewhat for Paul in going to these synagogues in the diaspora. And so uh, he builds on that groundwork and uh, basically states that, that John was a herald. Uh, he was the one who had to decrease so that, um, uh, so that the one, the Messiah, the Savior, was, uh, was able to uh, be recognized. And then there's a very interesting uh, point made in that last sentence, because he is addressing the sons of the family of Abraham, namely the Jews of the diaspora, but he is also addressing others among you who are God-fearing. The God-fearers were the people who were uh, pagans. They were Greeks, some of them rather wealthy, uh, who found the Jewish way of life to be attractive, especially their moral values, but were not prepared to become Jews themselves because in order to become a Jew, one would have to undergo circumcision and also observe all of the prescriptions of the law, including all of the regulations about kosher, uh, uh, kosher food. Uh, so uh, that would be very restrictive. And what it also meant was that they would be subject to ridicule by many of the, their townspeople, their, many of the pagans. Uh, they they had mixed feelings about the Jewish populations in their midst. They respected them because they were people of integrity, and at the same time, they ridiculed them because they refused to go along in worshiping the other gods. They were, you know, uh, nobody cared whether they worshiped the God of Israel. That's fine. But they did so exclusively and refused to worship what they called the false gods of the other people. That subjected them to persecution and to ridicule. So these God-fearers were the ones who really did ultimately accept the message of Paul that Jesus, not the old law, but Jesus is the source of our salvation. You know, and uh, 
you can imagine the wonders. You mean, you mean we can become, we can inherit the promises of that God made to the Jews by adhering to Jesus, not by having to become Jews ourselves. And that's basically the message of Paul, that what God promised in the past was available to all people through discipleship with Jesus. Okay, moving along, we have the 13th Sunday, the next Sunday, and the, uh, the story is one in which a story is told and then another story is told within it. That was a fairly common device in, in storytelling in the time of, uh, you know, the, in the first century, where you would embed one story in another and then draw something of a unified meaning through the two of them. So what we have is the word that comes to Jesus, the daughter of Jairus, is sick. And then there is a delay for the healing of the woman with a 12-year flow of blood. And because of that delay, the daughter dies. And so it became the occasion of a greater miracle. So let's take a look at this particular, uh, this, this particular gospel reading. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him, and he stayed close to the sea. One of the synagogue officials named Jairus came forward. Seeing him, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, saying, My daughter is at the point of death. Please come lay your hands on her that she may get well and live. He went off with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed upon him. Okay. Uh, I always find... Um, geology, not geology, geography, to be important in just understanding and placing uh, where we are when various things happen. It says, Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side. Well, where was he coming from? He had just um, uh, driven out the demons from that man in the Gerasene territory, which was on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, basically what is now known as the Golan Heights. So he was over there. And that was pagan territory for the most part. And uh, the region was actually called the Decapolis. There were 10 major Greek cities um, uh, basically in that area. And we don't know which one. It's, it's interesting uh, that the, um, the man who was possessed by the demons was, ex was uh, described as both being Gerasene and Gadarene. And those two cities, Gerasa and Gadara, were about 40 miles apart. So that was a fairly significant uh, uh, difference there. The gospel writer doesn't seem to care very much about uh, that nicety. All that was important was this was pagan territory on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Now he has come back home, which means that this synagogue and the synagogue official, Jairus, probably was in his adopted hometown of Capernaum. Uh, which was where uh, Peter and Andrew and James and John were from. It may have been one of the other cities along the coast. There are several others that were uh, named, but it was very likely Capernaum. And uh, the synagogue official, Jairus, as what we say, or Jairus, um, was not a rabbi. Uh, you know, we kind of see rabbis now as being the heads of synagogues, sort of like the priest is a pastor of a parish, the rabbi is a pastor of a synagogue. No, the rabbis were, were teachers. They were educators. They were spiritual leaders. The officials, the synagogue officials, were the ones that kept the lights on, that kept the, 
the, the, the treasury solvent so that the synagogue could continue. So they, this guy was probably more like a trustee, uh, rather a business official, rather than a religious official as such. Uh, so at, his name is Yair, and that was a fairly common uh, uh, Jewish name. We still run across it uh, in Jewish people, especially you know those who are in uh, in the Holy Land in Israel. The name Yair means he enlightens, uh, and Yair was one of the judges who ruled Israel between the conquest and settlement of Canaan under Joshua and the time of the kings. So. As I say, it was at that time it was a fairly common name. It has Old Testament roots and uh, a common Hebrew name. So what we have is in this plea was he had obviously he knew of Jesus, and his daughter was gravely ill, and please come, you lay your hands on her that she may get well and live. So there was a certain level of faith there, but as we see in both of these people, um, that faith was kind of in a rudimentary form, uh, faith in healing, but not necessarily faith in God or in Jesus as life giver. So the huge crowd followed him. People were jostling, as crowds in the Middle East and here often do. So let's see what else happened. Moving right along. There was a woman afflicted with hemorrhages for 12 years. She had suffered greatly at the hands of many doctors and had spent all that she had. Yet she was not helped, but only grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. She said, if I touch his clothes, I shall be cured. Immediately her flow of blood dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Okay, well, probably nobody, quote, noticed exteriorly what her affliction was. It's, it's almost impossible to assume that she was completely anonymous, that she uh, was unknown. I mean, uh, that situation for existing for 12 years would have made her kind of the town outcast. Why? Because... Uh, contact with blood, and particularly for a woman when she is menstruating, uh, she is unclean. She is ritually unclean. Now that does not necessarily mean sinful, but it does mean requiring to be purified in order to come back into both society and into worship. If she has a continuing flow of blood, there's no possibility of purifying her, ritual purification. So everybody would shun her. Uh, her affliction, therefore, was a both a social one as well as a physical and medical uh, affliction because she, she could not associate with people in a normal way. Even what she did, coming up anonymously behind Jesus and touching his, uh, his garment, would have rendered Jesus himself ritually impure, ritually unclean. So she was taking a really big risk. She could, if she was found out, she could perhaps even have been stoned by violating the law in that way. So uh, she was rather passionate about what she wanted and what she needed and what she had to do in order to get it even if it may have been tinged with a little bit of superstition. You know, uh, most people come up to Jesus and ask for a healing. She thinks, well, let me just touch his garment and, uh, and I'll be healed by that kind of an automatic uh, gesture, automatic action. But the fact is, she was healed and uh, she felt it, obviously, felt it in her own body happening, even if nobody else was, uh, was aware of it. Now, except 
Jesus was aware of it too. Jesus, aware at once that power had gone out from him, turned around in the crowd and asked, Who has touched my clothes? But his disciples said to Jesus, You see how the crowd is pressing upon you, and yet you ask, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. The woman, realizing what had happened to her, approached in fear and trembling. She fell down before Jesus and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be cured of your affliction. So, uh, you can just imagine the crowd. Everybody was touching Jesus. You know, the, the disciples were saying, you know, what do you mean, who touched me? Everybody is touching me. Uh, but uh, he was aware, and it wasn't the act of touching. It was the act of faith, and he makes that very clear, that it's your faith that healed you. It was faith that triggered, if you will, the release of the power of healing. It's very interesting, a number of other instances, Jesus also says, your faith has saved you. Uh, sort of like deflecting it from, well, it's not my power and my choice here, I'm zapping this cure into you, but rather God's power is working and it is your faith that is um, triggering the release of God's power. Uh, so what, what we have here is also an example of the woman being moved from one level of faith, sort of a superstitious one, uh, based on external action, to another level of faith in Jesus Christ as the sign of God's um, healing power and healing love. So, moving along, now we go back to the synagogue official. We continue. God did not make death. No. While he was still speaking. The, the gospel isn't finished yet. Sorry. The gospel is not finished yet. Joan? Oh, thank you, Father. While he was still speaking, people from the synagogue official's house arrived and said, Your daughter has died. Why trouble the teacher any longer? Disregarding the message that was reported, Jesus said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid, just have faith. He did not allow anyone to accompany him inside except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they arrived at the house of the synagogue official, he caught sight of the commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. Okay, notice what happens because of that delay. She dies. They say, she's dead. Nothing more can be done. That's when Jesus shows himself not as healer, but as life giver. And uh, so again, brings their faith to a new level. Not just that favors are done for, for the family, but that life is restored, that Jesus is life giver. And that's a completely different dimension. And I think that's an important thing to think about and to, and to really you know, focus our prayer on. Uh, now the commotion out there, people weeping and wailing loudly, well, that's what people did on the event of death, uh, almost immediately the people from the town, and oftentimes, especially if you were wealthy, you employed people to kind of stimulate, stir up that, that emotion. That There were professional mourners who would come to um, occasions like this and get paid for weeping and wailing. And, uh, uh, really doing it up good. So, so he went in and said to them, Why this commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but asleep. And they ridiculed him. Then he put them all out. He took along the child's father and mother and those who were with him and entered the room where the child was. He took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha, who which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. 
The girl, a child of twelve, arose immediately and walked around. At that they were greatly astounded. He gave strict orders that no one should know this and said that she should be given something to eat. Okay. Uh, clearly, she was dead. So, you know, for Jesus to say, well, she's not dead, she's asleep. No, Jesus, sorry, you're wrong. He, she's dead. Uh, and, um, of course, he was talking about the ultimate outcome, that it wasn't, that, that sleep was the metaphor that he would wake her up from in raising her from the dead. So, uh, it's not like there's... Uh, sort of play acting here that they were mistaken that she was really just asleep. No, Jesus was saying that, she, that affirming that she was dead, but this is not going to be permanent, that she will, that he will raise her. So, she goes in and Talitha kum. Okay, that's two words, and it's translated with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven words. Um, how can that be? What exactly does Talitha Koum mean? Well, first of all, those words are Aramaic. They're not Hebrew. They were the uh, language, the, the popular language that Jesus spoke and that many of the Jewish people and uh, people who are not Jews in that area also spoke. Uh, it's still spoken in a few small areas of, of, uh, of Syria where there are are or were uh, Syrian Christians. And uh, uh, what, does that, what does that expression mean? Talitha is a feminine form of a word tale, which means young. So a feminine young person, a uh, little girl. And kum was an imperative form of get up. So, little young person, get up. That's basically what those, what those two words literally mean. Interestingly, there's no process involved. She gets up. Right then. It's not like he had to breathe new life into her or something like that. It sort of looks like she jumps up. Because, you know, she gets up and walks around. Uh, now, it's pretty clear just the way that's said there that Jesus is not pulling her up by the hand. He takes her hand. Now, there is something else. She was dead. For him to touch a corpse rendered him ritually unclean also. So here on the same day there were two things happened to him that would make him unclean. And he, you know, very He's very affirming in both of those. And this one, he reaches out to her. Nobody would actually touch her body except for a couple of members of the family, women usually, who were uh, commissioned to prepare her body for burial. Other than that, um, she would not be touched by anybody, certainly not by a male. And so Jesus does something very significant by reaching out and taking her hand, which is kind of lost on us. We think that's just the normal thing to do. But among them, at that time, that was very, very unusual and dangerous because you were becoming, you were making yourself ritually unclean. Even a person who might have accidental contact with a dead body, uh, you know, and not realizing it, once you realize that once somebody points it out, uh, that person's unclean, and then has to go through ritual cleansing, a, a, a rite of um, similar actually to baptism, uh, have to go through a rite of washing uh, to to be to be cleansed. So, uh, and then of course this last thing, uh, give her something to eat. It was concern for her welfare, but also an evidence that you know I'm not playing a magic trick here. Corpses don't eat, even if uh, I manage to get them to walk around, uh, give her something to eat, that will be the final proof that she actually is restored to life. And of course, 
you may well be, be hungry. Okay, now the first reading from the Book of Wisdom. God did not make death, nor does he rejoice in the destruction of the living. For he fashioned all things that they might have being, and the creatures of the world are wholesome, and there is not a destructive drug among them, nor any domain of the netherworld on earth. For justice is undying. For God formed man to be imperishable. The image of his own nature he made him. By the envy of the devil, death entered the world. And they who belong to his company experience it. Okay, so what we have here is a reading from the Book of Wisdom. Now, Wisdom is one of the seven, I believe, deuterocanonical books. That word means a second list. It is not found in the Protestant Bible. And uh, there is a long story behind that to make it make a long story short. Those books actually date from late in the Old Testament times, maybe 100, 200 years before Christ. They're found only in Greek, not in Hebrew. And um, they came mostly from the diaspora. Uh, the Book of Wisdom was probably written in Alexandria. There was a large community of Jews in Alexandria in the couple of centuries before Christ, probably larger, uh, more, more Jews in Alexandria than there were in Jerusalem. And uh, that's one reason why, uh, just a little footnote here, uh, that flight into Egypt wasn't quite so much going into strangers in a foreign land at risk by themselves, because there was a huge Jewish community there in Egypt that would have welcomed the Holy Family, possibly their own relatives. Some of them may have, uh, may have been down there. So um, uh, the flight into Egypt is significant, but Let's remember that Jews were scattered throughout the Roman Empire in the diaspora at that time. So we have this wisdom coming from Jewish people in the diaspora, and basically what it is saying is that destructive things like death are not from the hand of God. God's will is for life, and therefore it's the envy of the devil that death and destruction has entered into the world. To me, this, this is a big, uh, this passage is a great form of meditation on okay, what actually is the source of, in, of, of sin in our lives. What is the greatest sin? And I think a good case could be made that envy is the root of all sin, that we cannot be content with the way things are, so we have to make things the way that we want them to be. And that is the source of sin. Okay, the last reading here uh, is the second reading from 2 Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, as you excel in every respect in faith, discourse, knowledge, all earnestness, and in the love we have for you. May you excel in this gracious act also. Go ahead. For you know the gracious act of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. Now what he's telling them is reminding them of the mystery of Jesus Christ that he had already taught them. He's reminding them of something that they already knew. And there's a reason why he is doing this. 
and why he is really complimenting them and buttering them up, as it were. He's preparing for the big ask. Go ahead. Not that others should have relief while you are burdened, but that as a matter of equality, your abundance at the present time should supply their needs, so that their abundance may also supply your needs, that there may be equality. As it is written, whoever had much did not have more, and whoever had little did not have less. Okay, so we have basically here the homily that pastors give every year uh, when they are making their stewardship appeal. Uh, butter them up first, tell them how wonderful they are, and then make the ask. Uh, what really is Paul doing here? Well, uh, the church in Jerusalem was very poor. Uh, they did not have a lot of resources, and they were still being persecuted by the Jews in Jerusalem. So they, they needed help. Furthermore, the church in Jerusalem uh, looked suspiciously upon Paul because he was spreading the faith in Jesus Christ among the non-Jews, the Gentiles. And they felt that he was corrupting what was the true faith in Jesus, which was continuity with the old law. Paul saw a disruption there, a, 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 a separation. And so Paul was kind of, as I say, looked at with suspicion by the Jewish uh, Christians in Jerusalem. Now, uh, he knew that they were in need. So he went around to all of his churches that he had founded, taking up a collection to take back to Jerusalem. And there were two motives there, one of which was they needed it. And you've got it, so share with them. But the other motive in Paul's mind had to be to win himself a little bit more favor, to kind of use this collection, these donations, as a way of affirming that he was still united to them in spirit and in love. So um, that did it work? Kind of, but they always still kind of, they didn't really support Paul's mission and ministry. He still had to, you know, keep going. So what's his uh, conclusion there in this ask? Well, he goes back to what God did in when the Jews were out in the desert. This last quotation was about manna in the book of Exodus. Uh, when the manna came, they could only gather the amount that they needed for that day. And whoever had much did not have more, did not have more than they needed. And whoever had little did not have less. So there was God provided, and if God provides more than what you need, uh, you need to share. So that's kind of the timeless message of stewardship, and it still is a message for us today. So, so thank you very much, and God bless you all. And the next Banquet of the Word will be Tuesday, July 3rd, which is my feast day, St. Thomas the Apostle. So, thank you and God bless you.